Well, I'm with James. I love Wednesday evenings, and I'm glad that you're here. I have been so thankful that we have been stretching and strengthening our prayer muscles this year, and we're going to keep doing that. It's working. I can see it working in my life, and I know that it's working in our church. And so uh, we're going to do that again this evening. This evening, we're going to look at a very unique prayer. It's a, a prayer of adoration. So if we keep thinking about, we've talked about praising God, we've talked about confession, we think about these different aspects of prayer. The, the prayer tonight is going to be primarily on adoration, which is actually something that can be tough for us. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited about what this example of prayer will teach us. So I invite you to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 in your Bibles. 1 Chronicles chapter 16 in your Bibles. Now, as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context notes because it will help us as we dive in. First of all, in, uh, in the story that's surrounding what we see in 1 Chronicles 16, now in my Bible, uh, I, have, I have headings over sections. And so 1 Chronicles 16, the, the heading over verse 1 says, the ark placed in the tabernacle. And then the heading over verse 7 says, David's song of thanksgiving. So, so what's happening here? If you, if you look back just a little bit in the story, in chapter 11, David is crowned king of Israel. And so he, he now, he, first, you know, for a few years he was just in Hebron, but now all of Israel has accepted him. He's the new king, and he's establishing his throne. They've conquered Jerusalem, and he's, he's moving in. Uh, he's wanting to set up his kingdom now, okay? And so what he does is, actually, in chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles, he begins to move the Ark of the Covenant. Now, remember, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines earlier, right? Well, now he's wanting, the, the Israelites have it back. He's now wanting to move it up to nearby Jerusalem, to Gibeon, to the tabernacle that David set up. And if you remember the story, they started to move the, ta- the Ark, and they hadn't followed through the way that God told them to move the ark, right? You're supposed to move it on the poles. Well, they put it on an ox cart, and one of the oxen stumbled, and a man reached out, Uzzah, and and he died the moment that he touched that holy ark. And and so they paused. They left the ark. David went and prayed and said, okay, how are we supposed to do this? Then he came back. And in chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles, it's a huge procession. They have the Levites. David has now said, no, we're going to do this right. We're going to carry it the right way. And it's, this, it's a major ordeal. It, it's fantastic. It's this huge praise procession as they're bringing the ark up to the top of the hill, and they're wanting to install it. In chapter 16, then verse 7 says, On that day David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. So what we have in verses 8 to 36 then is this massive praise for what God has done, that he's restored the ark. The ark is now in the tabernacle. David is the king. They're thanking God for what he's done. They're adoring and praising God. That's what's happening, okay? But, that, so that's the immediate context. But there's actually another context that I think really helps us, and, and I, want, I don't want us to miss this evening. It's good for us at times to pause and say, okay, who wrote this? And I don't know if you've thought about that. This is a history book. David didn't write this. Who wrote this story? Who did God inspire to include this story? Well, First and Second Chronicles, we, we call the author the chronicler. It's a great name. Because officially, it's anonymous. Now, most Bible scholars that I know believe that Ezra was the one that put these two together. What does that mean? That means these were put together, and we know this from some of the language and the dates that are included. First and Second Chronicles, were, were, this was written at the very end of Israel's Old Testament history. If you know who Ezra is, Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries. So you have Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles, and then you have Malachi, and the Old Testament story closes. So who was the chronicler? Who was Ezra writing to? He's writing to folks that had been taken into captivity, and they'd spent years in captivity, and now they're returning 
to Israel. Remember, just on Sunday, we started Hosea. So Hosea was in the mid-700s. Israel fell in 722. This is mid-400s. We're talking 300 years after the wars started, after the stuff started really falling apart. So you've got a group of people that are now re-entering Jerusalem. Jerusalem walls are broken down. The temple is not anything like what, what was built in Solomon's time. And the folks are going, God, are you good? God, are you faithful? God, do you still love us? So David prayed this prayer of praise and adoration at this moment in celebrating the history, and God inspires the chronicler 300 years later. Let's include this. The people that are discouraged, that are looking at, God, where have you gone? Where's your glory? It used to be so much better. What's left now? God inspired the chronicler to include this to encourage people in the post-exilic time. Are, are you with me? So let me just say this for our group. If you're discouraged, if you're discouraged about our nation, if you're discouraged about our church, if you're discouraged about your family, you need to hear this praise. You need to hear how, what God inspired Ezra, I believe, to include and how David responded. That God is alive and God is active. God's at work. He hasn't missed a beat. He knows exactly what he's doing. Does it help to have the context? Are you excited about this? I'm excited about this. Can you tell? Now, I'm, I'm not worried about this. You may be looking at, if you have your notes, and if you're watching online, it's okay. Uh, we're going to be very careful. To, the notes are very easy to follow. I'm going to encourage everybody to have a pen or a crayon or a pencil or a highlighter, a quill, something. Don't prick your finger and try to write. Don't do that. You can take a pen out of the, the seat back in front of you. But I'm encouraging everyone to take notes. And if you're watching at home, grab a piece of paper and a pen because we're going to work through this and I'm going to give you some activities. And I'm not worried about the time. Here's what I mean by that. We'll go to eight and we'll stop wherever we are. And the next time I have an opportunity to preach, we'll keep going. Because I was working on this earlier and I went... I'm taking all my notes, and, and I'm, I'm going, I'm not sure we're going to have enough time. This is too good. We're going we're gonna to digest this slowly. So don't worry about the time. We're going to enjoy this tonight, and then we'll pick up right where we left off the next time we get to meet for a prayer meeting. Okay? So here we go. The first point is this, of an adoring prayer. Verses 8 to 13, I've entitled, Boast of God's Greatness. So you can fill in those blanks. Boast of God's Greatness. That's verses 8 to 13. So let me read verses 8 to 13. And if you are a note taker, I want to encourage you, as we're reading this, look at all the imperative verbs, all the imperative verbs, all the commands that we see here. Look at this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Wow, there's a lot there. So if you, if you want to underline or mark, listen to all these different commands. He says, give thanks to Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. We should thank him. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds. Tell everyone. We just heard a testimony of that. If you're going through cancer treatments, tell people who God is, who you're trusting in for your healing. We should be telling other people what God has done. Sing, sing psalms. We did it tonight, didn't we? Twice. It's what we should be doing. We should be talking of his wondrous works. We should glory or boast. And that's not a bad thing. We need to boast in God, in his glory. We need to be telling other people how great he is. Exalting him. We need to rejoice that's what that command is. 
Let the hearts of those rejoice. Those who seek the Lord. If you're seeking the Lord, it should be resulting in joy in your life. Search for Yahweh and His strength. We do need to be seeking God's strength. Seek Yahweh's face always. Are you drawing close to Him? Are you desiring to be in His presence? Are you asking Him to draw close to you? Remember. Remember what? He gives us three things. Remember, first of all, His His works, his marvelous works, which he has done. We're going to do this in just a moment. Remember his wonders. I love that word wonders. That's the exact same word if you go back to Exodus. What God did in Egypt, we call them plagues. God calls them signs and wonders. So that word wonders would have reminded these hearers what God did in Egypt to take them out to rescue them from slavery. And the judgments of his mouth, his determinations. God chose Israel to love them. There's 10 different commands in the introductory part of this prayer. By the way, I forgot to mention this earlier. You may be recognizing some of these words in God's sovereignty and in his uh, under his inspiration these are psalms as well this is psalm 105 quoted verbatim this is psalm 96 the first 13 verses and it's several verses from psalm 106 how great is that so we those three different psalms we get the historical context of where they came from with david and asaph praising the Lord. So here's what I'd like us to do. I gave you, in, in your paper now, you have a big, uh, you, have, you have some white space, and that's on purpose. So my question is now, I'd like for us to do a little work here. This is practicing our praying muscles. The question I have for you is, what have you seen? I want to boast in God's greatness, boast of God's greatness for the next few minutes this evening. I want us to do this now. I want us to obey what God's Word says. So the question is, what have you seen? And here's, here's the first thing I'd like you to do. With your pencil or your pen, I'd like you to work quickly. List the first nine works that God brings to your mind, what he's done, his greatness that you've seen in your life. And I'd like you to do it right now. We don't, we don't have a lot of time, so start, start writing. Have those pencils move. What are nine things that you've seen God do in your life? His works, His wonders, His greatness. You've seen His greatness. The first nine things that come to mind. They just start flooding, don't they? As soon as you start writing, you start, oh, and he did this. Oh, and he did this. Oh, and he answered this prayer. Oh, and this. Oh, and that's right, this happened. Oh, I remember when he answered this. And you know where we should start is we should start with, he saved me. He didn't have to. In my rebellion, In my disobedience, in my ugliness, he reached down and loved me. What an amazing, amazing thing. So now I'd like you just to take a moment right now and pray. I'd like for you just pause and pray and thank God 
for his greatness toward you. So just privately in your chair, just take a moment and thank him. Father, you are great. You are a great God. And even this evening, something that we've been praying for for months now, you've allowed us to see your greatness in our brother getting a report today on his birthday that you've healed him from cancer. And we say thank you. You are a good God. And we want to tell others about you. In your son's name we come to you. Amen. Now I'd like us to specifically obey this. He says, make known his deeds among the people. Verse 9, talk of all his wondrous works. So I'd love for you to turn and find a neighbor near you and share one of the things that you wrote down. Share with someone else. Take just a moment. It can be loud in here for a moment. Go ahead. Juan, can you share with me what's something great that God's done? Amen. Me too. I'm with you, brother. Amen. All right. We got to keep going. Let's, let's get another one or two in here. So first of all, the, David tells us, Asaph tells us to boast of God's greatness in this prayer, this, this uh, amazing song of thanksgiving. And then we have remember God's faithfulness. Look at verses 14 to 22. 14 to 22. He says this, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statue, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance when you were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. When they went from one nation to another and from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. So think about what he's saying here. He's saying that God gave Abraham first, Abram, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. He gave them this covenant, this promise, right? This beautiful land. And as David is saying this, as we're seeing this in the story in 1 Chronicles, they were then taken into captivity, but God took them out of captivity, out of Egypt, and then he formed them as a nation. He gave them the land, and they can say he even protected us from our enemies. And in David's time, God was giving them amazing military victories. He was giving them the land, this beautiful land. And so they're right to thank him and say, you were faithful, because this started with a handful of people. And we know coming into the land that the, the numbers are somewhere between two and three million Israelites were coming into the land. I mean, there's a huge nation now. They can see this. But think about this in the Chronicler's day. Now they have even more history, don't they? It's almost 600 years past David. And now they've seen their disobedience as a nation. And they've seen God's judgment and his punishment saying, you can't live that way. You're my covenant people. I will discipline you for your disobedience. And he sent them into captivity. And now the chronicler and, and, the, and the recipients of First Chronicles, they're seeing this and they're going, and now God, you've actually held on to us. You didn't wipe us off the face of the earth. You held on to us in your love and you carried us through those dark years and now you are restoring us back to this beautiful land. So what's interesting about this is the, in the chronicler's day, they're looking at the big picture, aren't they? Because there were individuals that were lost in this. There were prophets that died. 
but they're looking at the big picture saying, God, you are good and you are faithful. What a great picture. So, here's my encouragement to us as we remember God's faithfulness tonight. I'd love for you to consider specifically, the first notes I wanted you to take was to to write down God's greatness, but now I want to narrow it down, be more specific. How has God been faithful How has he been faithful to you? And I'd like for you to do two things. What I did on my paper was I made a little little vertical line and then a horizontal line to make a little table. And on the left side, I wrote down three ways that God's been faithful to me personally. And then on the right side, I would like for you to list three ways that you've seen God's faithfulness in our church. Now, I understand that some of you, uh, you're, you're newer to the church. But I hope that you can still do this. Hopefully you've already heard testimonies, even if you've only been here for a few months. I mean, I mean one of the, I'll give you one of the, the first ones that comes to mind. We pray, we plead with God. We beg God to use us for his glory on the first Sunday in April. God's been faithful. God has been faithful. And if you're newer and you have no idea what I'm talking about, please talk to me afterwards. Because I got to share that today. I got to proclaim God's goodness. I met someone for the first time and got to share. This is, you, you wouldn't believe what God does. This is amazing. Let me share this with you. So take a few moments, three ways that you've seen God's faithfulness in your own life, and then three ways you've seen God's faithfulness at our church. Now, after you've done that, made those, those two little lists, I want to encourage you again just to bow your head, close your eyes, and privately thank God for his faithfulness because truly he has been faithful. And I'll, I'll give you one more as I was writing this down. Pastor Jerry, I see you as a specific answer to prayer. God has, it's God that's been faithful But God's faithfulness to this church is you. You're a gift to the church of God's faithfulness to this church. You really are. And he gets the glory, doesn't he? And I think I was telling you the story. The only reason you're still here is because God's kept you on the horse, right? Um, and, And it's true. God's the one that's keeping him on the horse. But I think all of us that know Pastor Jerry and know Pastor Jerry's testimony, you know that's God's gift of faithfulness. That's God's faithfulness to our church. Um, and we get, to, we get to reap the benefits of that. So take a moment and thank God for his faithfulness. Oh, Father, you are faithful when we are not. We don't deserve your faithfulness. But you are so loving and you are so consistent. Paul said it earlier, you do not change. And we thank you. We thank you that you are a faithful God. Amen. All right, well, what we'll do is we'll take one more point, and I'm going to start this point. And then we'll start with this point again next time. But I want to give you an introduction to it, and then, uh, and then we'll wrestle with this again uh, when we start the next time that we get back together and, and I'm, I'm uh, preaching. The next point is declare God's uniqueness. This is verses 23 to 27. He says, sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation. 
from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be, he also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. So what he's saying here is he's saying, sing, declare, praise, speak up about God. Tell others how powerful and great he is. And he is unique. That means he is alone. And I want us to to wrestle with this as we leave this evening. He's alone. What does that mean? There are no other gods like him. And when we we read the Old Testament and we know that they were sacrificing to idols, I think sometimes we can say, well, I don't have that. I don't have a a weird little statue in my house. I'm I'm not, I don't, I don't do that, right? I don't, I don't bow down to idols. But church, I, I hope, listen for just a moment. I hope you understand that idols are more than just little wooden statues. We have idols that look really shiny and have four wheels. We have idols that are flat and they keep getting bigger and bigger and we mount them in more and more places on our walls and in our homes. We have idols in our pockets. We have idols that we log in online and we, we watch those numbers grow. We have idols in little bottles and we take them and believe that they're gonna heal us. We have lots of idols. But God is unique. God is the true God. God is the one that's all powerful. And God is the one that truly saves. A bank account is not going to save you. A fancy car is not going to save you. A, 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 A bottle of pills is not going to save you. God is the one that saves you. Now, he may choose to use those pills. But God is the one that's going to save you. And we'll we'll spend more time with this the next time we gather together. But he says, sing to the Lord all the earth. Verse 23, proclaim the good news of his salvation. God is the one who saves. He is our only hope. He's our only hope. And I do want to offer this to you. I think I know where a lot of you are tonight. We're, we're in open conversations. There's some of you I, I don't know where, where your hearts are at. I don't know you well. If you're here tonight and you're discouraged and you're asking, God, where, where is the hope? Finish reading this passage. This passage proclaims God's power and his uniqueness and his glory. But I encourage you to talk with me. Our God is a God of hope because he saves. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your past. Our God will save you if you will turn to him and you will ask him to help you. He is always the God of hope. And I hope all of you that are saved and you know him as your God of salvation, we've got to be telling other people, don't we? Let's proclaim his goodness. Make his name known. All right, let me pray for us and we'll pick up here in a couple of weeks when we get back together. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the hope that you give us, that you are on your throne and you do know what you're doing. Thank you for being a faithful God, an all-powerful God. Thank you for inspiring this word that we can trust and we can turn to. Will you please encourage us in you? Thank you, Father. And it's in your precious son's name that we come to you. Amen.